we were, before you started recording, uh, we were talking about sort of my general relationship with uh, um, academic scholars. And, you know, in many instances, it's been very good. Um, really, the first one that I ever communicated with um, was Harold Ellens, Dr. Ellens. And um, I wanted him to uh, review Caesar's Messiah. And I didn't know how, um, you know, kind of strange the request was. He was um, sort of the head of the food chain of the academic um, kind of peer review system. He was the head of the Society for Biblical Literature. And uh, I asked him if he and his organization would review it. And he said, well, no, uh, you know, you have to have a PhD. Um, and I had an exchange with him. And he said, well, this sounds interesting. And he read the book and then actually did review it. And we worked together for a bit to um, uh, just to tweak some of the, uh, you know, Greek errors I had made, whatnot. Um, but he then wrote a really nice uh, review of the book. Um, which I put on the blur of my of the cover, um, and then other academics, um, you know, like Robert Eisenman. Uh, he he really liked the book, and Robert was really the one who attempted to, or you know worked with me to get the thing published. Uh, he wanted it to be published, and uh, because of his efforts, really, I was able to get Ulysses to uh, to do the first publication of it. Um, another scholar, Rod Blackhurst, um, and that was kind of a long story how I got involved with him. But anyway, so th these had been really good, um, you know, kind of relationships, uh, very, you know, good criticism. I, I then got a criticism from Robert Price, Dr. Price, and he, he said the book was suffering from parallel mania. And so he and I had a long debate, which is on the internet, um, two hours, just exhausting kind of, you know, kind of was exhausting sort of debate, but um, which did not, I don't think came to any particular resolution, but he then over the years sort of warmed up to the theory and now he's actually supporting it, uh, which is um, kind of amazing. I, I don't, I can't really recall anyone else changing their mind usually whatever position someone has about the book and about any book in in christian scholarship is what they end up with um just to digress i was in a little kind of uh, yahoo group called jesus mysteries and it had just dozens of dozens of uh, authors earl doherty was there and we went around and around for a couple years and then one of them uh really kind of insightful guy named Rod Green. He said, you know, guys, he says, uh, this is strange. And he says, we've had thousands of exchanges among us, and I don't think anyone has changed their mind about anything. <laughs> so <laughs> right. why are we doing right. this, you know? Okay, um, can we, okay, bring, can it we up bring it up to Richard to Carriers? Richard Carriers. Carriers. Well, yeah, I had an exchange with him years ago that was uh, – brought about because someone had said that he had written a criticism of Caesar's Messiah, and it seemed like a very odd criticism. It didn't seem like he read the book. And so I communicated with him, and sure enough, he said he hadn't read the book, but had an impression about it just from what he had heard. And so I said, well, don't do that. That's you know not a good way to critique it. Let me send you the book. And he refused to read the book. He said, give me your best example. And I said, this Richard, it's not, a, crazy. it's not a good idea because this is, I'm, I'm presenting a typological system, which is, you know, created by sequence. It's not a good idea to try to analyze it just one at a time. And so he said, no, no I, I don't have time to do anything else. Send me one example and I'll see if it's, uh, if I like it. And I think I sent him two or three examples and, and then he, he didn't like, them as unique parallels and so we had this long kind of particularly about the uh the parallel of the demons of Gadara, which he said i mean he, one of his claims was is that it was Gadara was too far away from the sea to have an you know like been the place of the uh of, you know of, of the the sea battle and and the uh um and so it couldn't be even though it's only a 40 minute walk really you know and and 
he also, I was trying to remember, he said, uh, well, anyway, so we had this exchange and, um, and then uh, nothing really came. It was just a personal exchange between the two of us. And then when uh, I was doing a lecture in, in Britain and I was getting a lot of publicity. Um, and so Richard then put out a piece uh, which, you know, had his normal, you know, like I'm a crank. Um, I think he's called me a liar, probably. I, he normally does. But anyway, and so I just, I wrote a response called uh, Richard Carrier, the PhD who drowned at Ghadara. <laughs> and, I, and, and I pointed out that Gadara actually had a harbor on the Sea of Galilee that had been discovered in the last like 20 years or something. Richard was unaware of it. So, you know, that was the that was just the ex extent of the of the thing with Carrier. Um, the the there's a in general, um, I think that criticism against me from others, I won't name names, but just to, like there has been a lot of criticism of, from people who haven't read the book. And I think what why that has come about is simply because of the, the success of Caesar's Messiah uh, commercially. I mean, in English, it sold over 120,000 copies, which I mean, a bestseller in, you know, in this genre would be like five or 10,000 books. So it's, it's been, you know, it, it's had this huge success the um, the documentary has been seen. I mean, the the official site has about two million, but I think the other the illegal ones it's over four million views. So it's like, you know, it's a very uh, you know well known um, theory. And the fact is, is that New Testament scholarship is a very very low resource area. Uh, most of the people are you know, they, they will give lectures at the Humanist Society in, you know, Wisconsin or someplace, and they have to sleep on the sofa um, in order to make ends meet. It's a, it's a tough world to, to get a living in. Um, and so I think that's kind of like where a lot of the uh, resentment came, because I was just, the, the book was very well known, and, and it was a bombastic theory. You know, it, it, it doesn't really um, fit well into... Um, other theories. It was it was very original and and uh, um, and so it couldn't really plug into other people's PhD theses and and so um, the the criticism was at that level. I thought it was just sort of resentment because it was so successful. So I that see. was my take. I see. Um, you know, you 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 would have to go point by point. Um, there has been, I mean, some of the criticism has been has been good. I think. I think particularly. You know the um, uh, when you get into the really exotic typological relationships, uh, you know where you get where it's not just this the the sequence of events that I show in in the Flavian signature chapter of the book, which is very mechanical and easy to understand, and I think just is completely irrefutable because it's just so self evident. But when you get into other areas of my um, analysis in Caesar Messiah, they certainly are open to criticism because I am, I'm, I'm in, to some extent conjecturing as to what is possible to understand once you have established um, the uh, uh, the relationship between Josephus and uh, and and the New Testament. Um, I, I also think that uh, you can read Josephus in a different way. I think that that uh, once you understand the relationship between uh, the, uh, the the synoptic gospels and uh, wars of the Jews, then the whole history of Josephus uh, becomes more of a fictional piece and, and a typologic piece than a history. You, you look at it through different eyes. I mean, just as an example, um, you know, uh, Josephus records uh, the abomination of desolation occurring at exactly the midpoint of the uh, seven year war between Rome and the Jews. Um, this is ludicrous and it's obviously an attempt to create a theological structure and propaganda. Um, and, and, but it's Josephus presents it with a straight face like it's history. But I think the whole, um, all of Josephus really is, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure there was a war, obviously, but I think that the the history that we have is, uh, uh, was developed as as uh, propaganda. I mean, if you look at the uh, 
the, the idea that Titus Flavius didn't want to destroy the temple and that the Jews basically were responsible for burning their own temple down. I mean, this is really far-fetched, don't you think? So uh, it's, it's really, you know, once you've got the, the typologic fish, fiction um, demonstrated and sort of understood, then, you know, the, the history of Josephus disappears and you just have uh, Flavian propaganda. Okay, may I may okay, I make, may a, I, comment? May I make a comment? Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Um, as far as, as I'm far concerned, as I'm concerned, the historiographers, the historiographers have utterly have lacked, utterly lacked any, sense, any of comprehension sense of comprehension of what they <laughs> of read. What they read. <laughs> okay. You have to look at the whole thing through that lens. The historicity as a as a premise is gone, and. You know, it's even like uh, there's a, a like a, I think his name is Steve Mason, and he's done a new um, translation. And I was listening to an interview that he had done on Josephus, and he just they're very mechanical as far as this is history. You know, they talk about and Josephus was recording this and he's recording that. It, it's strange, isn't it? Because there's so many things in it that are just obviously fiction. I mean. Uh, Josephus's dream that where God uh, tells him that all of the favor has gone over to the Romans from the Jews. I mean, this seems a little far-fetched, doesn't it? So the, the, the um, uh, you know, it's all we have of the first century, and so people don't really want to lose it as history, but I'm sorry. It's, uh, to me, it's uh, once, once you get, it, all anyone has to do is just read the uh, the Flavian signature chapter in Caesar's Messiah. What is it like, fifteen pages or something? And it's that's the end of Josephus as a history. It is just a uh, a piece of propaganda that uses uh, typology um, to you know make its subtle points about uh, the the divinity that the uh, Roman Caesars claimed. Okay, um, please okay, tell us, um, please about, tell your us about your training in languages. In languages. Yeah. Um, very little. I um, studied uh, when I was in elementary school. I went to a, 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 a what's called a military academy in uh, Tokyo. My family was one of the first uh, non-military families, and so I went to St. Mary's Military Academy uh, for, I guess, the first four years. And it was very religious. The uh, the you know you had uh, Christian brothers and and other Jesuits were there as well. And so they, you know, the study of the gospels was every day. And, and, and because I, you know, you had to be an altar boy, I learned Latin and, uh, you know, we had the Latin mass at that time and, and they insisted on you understanding it. And, and they would also uh, lapse into the Greek. Um, you know, they would actually talk about the translation and so they would give us little lessons and that stuff and I, I wasn't particularly interested in that um, and uh, um, and so then uh, later on um, the the real kind of uh, connection into uh, the gospels was just this curiosity about the character of Jesus I mean I'd fallen away from the faith I've been raised a Catholic but I had no particular reason I just other things were more compelling surfing in the beach you know was like kind of pulling me away and and so I, I I then later on um I had enough time after I uh had uh, sold my business so that I could indulge in some of you know more kind of hobbies and and that's really what what it was Phil I was just it was a hobbyist I was reading quite a few books about um Jesus and I became very interested in one aspect, and this is what really led me into the whole thing, is I, I was reading um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls to, because they're, they had this Messianic movement, and I simply couldn't understand why this militaristic Messianic movement wasn't mentioned in the New Testament. It just amazed me. Um, I mean, it's such a tiny area they're coexisting at the same time. They, they're using the same proof text. That was the thing that was really surprising to me is that so many of the proof texts that are you know, found uh, in, in, the, uh, in the gospels, you know, the book of Isaiah, you know, all of the, you, you would see being used in kind of the same way, actually, 
uh, though from a different theologic perspective, of course, but they were, they were used typologically um, in, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I was just wondering, well, what was the relationship between these, uh, these groups? And one of the books that I had read I was reading when I was doing the kind of my hobby study of the Dead Sea Scrolls was uh, James, the brother of Jesus, Eisenman's book. And, um, and he really is the one who kind of gave me the idea about Roman hand in back of the uh, authorship. He, he doesn't specifically claim that. He's a very careful scholar, um, but he certainly points it out as a possibility. Okay, and okay. and so James, the brother of Jesus, was very influential on me. It opened up the idea that it, there could be a Roman hand. And so I decided I should read Josephus um, because I wanted to have a more informed place to try to do analysis of the Dead Sea Scrolls and their relationship into, into Christianity. And I, I, you know, where, what else can you turn to other than Josephus? And so I read it. And it was while reading it, I noticed that there was these odd relationships. And I noticed dozens of them that seemed to, and I thought that my first idea was, is that Josephus was aware of the gospels and was mocking it. it this is kind of a mockery of, of uh, the events, you know, in the history of, of Jesus that is told in the gospels. So anyway, then one day I simply had the insight that actually changed everything, which, which was simply that the parallels that I had been studying all occurred in the same sequence in, in, the, in the Gospels and in uh, Wars of the Jews. And so then I realized that I was dealing with an intellectual system. Um, and so I started to puzzle it through. And I also found the, um, uh, the there, you know, you have the Jesus Titus parallels. Um, in, in the ministry of Jesus. But I also understood the Jesus-Moses um, parallels going back backwards, in other words, from before the adult ministry. Um, and I was quite uh, proud of the fact that I had been able to solve this because I hadn't read anything about it. But then I, I learned later on that it, it was well known to scholarship. Um, Goulder had written a whole book about it uh, years ago. So the Jesus-Moses parallels are actually a primer to alert the reader to the system of literature that the, um, the Gospels are, are written with. And so it is uh, concepts, names, locations, all occurring in the same sequence. And in, um, in the uh, Jesus-Moses uh, system, uh, you know, it's like eight events. Uh, and they're all taken from the Old Testament and then reused as, uh, as typologic structure, you know, for the life of Jesus. And some of them are really complicated. I mean, you wouldn't notice them as parallels unless they were contained within the system. Um, specifically, in, uh, you have, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the Gospels, you have Jesus being baptized. And this is the, uh, a parallel to the uh, Israelites passing through the Red Sea as they leave uh, Egypt. I mean, this is a conceptual parallel that's so broad it would just never be noticed. The, the author um, actually inserts a line from the Old Testament inside the story of uh, Jesus' baptism just to make it absolutely certain. But from the event itself, you could never um, gleam um, any, you know, kind of parallelism, but once you have the sequence, you can understand it. And, and that's really, th that sort of insight then led to, uh, you know, some of the parallels, uh, which I, I show in the, um, uh, you know, in the Flavian signature uh, chapter, um, uh, most, I mean, some are just completely routine. I mean, literally, they're the same event. I mean, Jesus says, you know, I'm going to, you know, he predicts the, the city of Jerusalem being circled with the wall. He predicts the temple is going to be raised. He says the abomination of desolation is going to happen. I mean, these things occur and it, within the typologic system, you know, um, that Josephus is, is in. But they're not, they're not that you don't need any imagination because they are literally the same historical event. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. The only thing that is 
in, in, those, in those cases, it's just that uh, that is novel in, in Caesar and Messiah. It's just that I point out that they're occurring in the same sequence, which oddly enough, I mean, this is, Phil, it's like the strangest thing because sequence is such a fundamental way of creating comprehension, but no one had ever bothered to look at the sequence of events in, in Jesus' adult ministry and try to uh, determine if there was any meaning to it. And in fact, it's the whole key to understanding the, uh, uh, the literature is that you have to understand that the sequence is very precise and it has a specific typologic relationship to uh, the war that uh, the Flavians fought against the Jewish rebels, you know, in which the Jesus's uh, predictions come true. Okay. Um, okay. So anyway, that was, um, that was kind of the, you know, that's the background of, of, you know, how I, how I sort of came to the idea that I should write the book. Um, I wrote a, uh, a really rough outline of the ideas and um, somehow um, I, I published an advertisement for some, and it's a, a biblical archaeologic review. I just had a little thing saying, you know, I, I have an idea about the gospels and I wrote, I put in the ad in and so a few people bought copies of it. And one of them got to Eisenman, Robert Eisenman, and he contacted me and um, we spent some time together and he, um, you know, thought the analysis was really worthwhile. And, and through him, I would got the publisher and, and was able to um, clean the book up a bit because Robert, you know, was, was giving advice. And, uh, and then um, I got it to Harold Ellens and, you know, eventually got published uh, um, in, uh, in the U S and in Germany. Um, I was able to buy the copyright back from Ulysses at a certain point. So now I own that in, in English. And then I have brought out, uh, there have been copies, there's versions of it now in French and in Spanish as well as German. So okay. it's- uh, um, if Okay, you'll allow, um, if you'll allow me. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, um, like I'd, I'd like to move on to a few questions. questions. Of course. Um, yes. um, okay, can okay. you briefly can you explain-, explain uh, uh, oh, wait, wait a oh, second. Wait, wait a second. Not 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 paying. Paying. I lost paying. my place. I lost my place. Sorry. 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 Hang on. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Our okay, copies, our of, copies Josephus, of Josephus. Where do they come? Where from? do they come from? Um, well, I mean, they come from uh, time period. The, the time old, period. Yeah, the oldest text we have would be, uh, I think, I'm like you know, like a eleven hundred. I'm not. I. I'm, it would certainly be in the middle of uh, like the kind of Middle Ages. Um, I, and I don't know, I, I actually don't know which would be the earliest one, but they it would be uh, copies of the original that would have uh, come from, uh, you, know, you know, manuscripts okay. that were okay. maybe dated what, into what, the Middle Ages. What do you think of what this? May, there may have been, have been, an, been an, an earlier, an earlier Aramaic, Aramaic Josephus, Josephus that then, that got, then adapted. got adapted. Um, would you, would um, you, would think, you, that's would you think that's possible? It's not possible to disprove the idea. Oh, does our evidence, does our evidence support, support Josephus, Josephus as, as, the, as, a military the, as a military commander? commander for instance. For instance. <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, I mean, this is, it's one of the things that kind of bothers me about modern, you know, sort of New Testament scholarship, particularly how they relate to Josephus. I mean, I, I think Josephus is a, it's just a nom de plume um, of a Flavian, probably not just one individual. I mean, people notice that the Greek in uh, antiquities is different than uh, the, some of the Greek in, in Wars of the Jews, the first book. And they, you know, they say that, well, maybe Josephus got a language instructor in between the two books. I mean, it's just, but the, the idea that um, this one individual would have done the life that he claims is just very far-fetched. I mean, first of all, he's Hasmonean, so he's from the royal family. Then he's a priest, and then he goes out and becomes members of all three sects, right? He says that there were three sects, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the scene, and I was a member of every one at, at a certain time. How um, likely, now, is, likely is that? Well, this is, I think, not only is it not <laughs> likely, but I mean, if, if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I don't think are the Essenes per se, but they certainly are an ascetic group. 
there's no way you could be like going in and out of that group, you know, just arbitrarily. I mean, they, they would kill you. It's a very, very serious situation. And so, and so then he goes on and now he, he somehow he's, uh, he's friends with Nero's wife. Um, and in spite of this, when the war breaks out, they make him military leader of the rebel forces of Galilee. He gets captured, um, and there's where God talks to him and tells him, you know, uh, my favor is my covenant is now gone. The old covenant is dead. There's going to be a new covenant between me and the Romans. And, um, and so then the Flavian, and then, and then he tells Vespasian that he's going to be Caesar, right? He makes this prediction, which when it comes true, the Flavians say, well, he's a prophet. We, we, we need him around. He has this great connection to God. That's handy. Um, and now, um, at, you know, then following the war, uh, they give him a townhouse and they're in the imperial family. They give him all of the books and, the, you know, that the enable him to write the, the history. I mean, this is ridiculous. What, what you have there, Phil, is the absolutely perfect life details to be in, unimpeachable as a, the historian of the war. This is what Josephus' life is made up of. It's all of those events that someone determined would make it impossible uh, to criticize Josephus's history as fake, you know, because he he knew he he was on both sides. He knew every single uh, aspect of you know what the Caesars were doing, um, but he also knew he was inside all of the uh, the Messianic rebels, so he could talk about their motivations and all of these details. Um, and of course, because he's been in all of the sects of Judaism, and he he was you know he was a you know the an unimpeachable authority and all of this. I mean, this is just ludicrous to me. I I mean, even irrespective, just forgetting the analysis of uh, you know the kind of deconstruction of the history as uh, as typology, um, it just on its face it just seems like it's a fake life, and um, people should look at that more carefully and, and not just robotically assume that he was a real person and this is a real history. Okay, now Josephus' okay, teacher, teacher. Banas. Banas. Yeah. Do you, do you have any you idea have any who Banas is? is? No. Okay, he's okay, Pan. Okay, he's Pan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, he's being, okay, he's taught, being taught by a by goat, a man, goat god. man god. <laughs> okay. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> Now, yeah. uh, now uh, Gatapata, Gatapata, that's one of the that's battles. one of the battles. In fact, yeah. it's, In where, fact, Joe, it's where Joe uh, he, uh, he, uh, he uh, goes over to the goes Roman over side. to the Roman side. He gets captured there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I believe now I believe that Jatapata, that Jatapata is simply a, is parallel, simply a name parallel name that says that Jupiter. Says Jupiter and Jupiter's, and Jupiter's boyhood, boyhood friend. friend was pan was pan that well i mean i think the marys uh, it, the the reason for the marys is just that the the word can mean rebellious female and so he was just making a comment on um the the rebellious messianic move, movement though is not named overtly and it's there but it's hidden um so it's covert, right? And so covertly, you have the, uh, the, the and, and these would be the people that um, are accused of having demonic possession, right? These are like Mary Magdalene has all these demons inside of her, you know, and then uh, different individuals have their, their, but this is just a way of representing the demonic uh, force that the Flavian saw as motivating the, uh, uh, the rebels against Rome. Um, and so the, all of the Marys um, and uh, Martha, which is just I think Aramaic for Mary, I mean that's that's just a a way of kind of covertly, you know, talking about women who were inside these Messianic movements, inside the Messianic movement that rebelled against Rome. Okay. I really like your idea though on the idea that you know you have like Jupiter and and uh, Pan, because I am positive that there is Roman paganism that they are um, subtly, you know, kind of um, tipping the hat to inside of their version of, uh, of 
of Judaism with that they're creating with because once you start to get into the idea of the Roman authorship, you realize that their thought world is producing it. This isn't a Jewish thought world. They have obviously the the scribes have tremendous um, understanding of uh, of Jewish uh, scripture. I mean, I, I think that um, if you want to look for you know the actual um, kind of intellectual expertise for writing the Gospels. You have to look in the Flavian, um, uh, their intellectual circle, you know, which would included the Herods and, and particularly the Alexanders. Uh, Philo uh, was the most famous Jewish intellectual of the era, uh, and he was the uncle of Tiberius Alexander, who was the Rome, the, the Flavian general who fought with them. He was Tiberius Alexander was the very first um, Roman citizen because he was a Roman citizen to stand for the Flavians uh, replacing the Julio-Claudians. And this was a real uh, brave move on Tiberius's part because uh, if, he had, if they had failed, if the, if the uh, Flavians had failed in their attempt to, to depose the Julio-Claudians, then he would have uh, obviously met the same fate. So he, he stood for them at, to become Caesar, um, but he also would have brought all of the understanding of uh, Hebraic literature uh, with him to the um, the circle around uh, the Flavians that then would have been able to produce the Gospels with all of its um, you know Jewish uh, literary structures and all this understanding of, of the Old Testament. Um, so, but okay, so that that was how how it gets written. But remember, it is a Roman piece of literature, and so you get it. I mean, like. There's the example of, of the, the guy who has the pitcher of water who is supposed to go and find the place where um, the uh, Passover uh, supper is going to be you know, held. And, and, um, and that's obviously a, a reference to Aquarius. You know, the, right, and right. So, so, so you have, so when you see that, the question is, is what else? So I really am anxious to, uh, after we have our discussion, I'm going to start studying your idea about Jopata and uh, Banos because I am quite interested in this. And I, okay. I okay. didn't know anything about it when I was writing Caesar's Messiah, um, but I'm, I'm very curious about it. And I would don't, like to don't actually forget, don't forget, Don't forget Don't Japheth. forget Japheth. Yeah. Josephus. Yeah. Josephus. Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Jephthah. Jephthah. Who slays, who his, own slays daughter, his own daughter as Agamemnon, as Agamemnon did, did in the Odyssey, in the Odyssey which is which repeatedly, is repeatedly referenced. referenced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, or yeah. in the Iliad. Or in the Iliad. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. My, my mistake. I'm sorry. My mistake. Okay. okay. But this is, but what, this they've is done. what they've done. They had yeah. conquered, they had conquered them, them back in the, back Old, in the Testament Old Testament times. times. They were already they were already adopting Jupiter. Jupiter. They just called they him just called him Yahweh. Because they're both Lord, they're both of, the Lord of the air, and so it and doesn't so matter. It doesn't matter. Anybody with that anybody I with that am I am after their after title, after their title, they are they Jupiter. are Jupiter. They equate to, equate to him. You know, um, you have you written this up because I'd like you to send that to me. I'd love to have a, a kind of a primer so that I could like uh, not spend too much time. Excellent. You know, trying to Excellent. understand the detail. I'd like to know more about this because this is an area I'm really quite curious about. Excellent. And I, I, and I know, I I know it's in there. I know it's there. And I just didn't have the, yeah. it's, you know, yeah. I just didn't have it's, the background to be able to uh, decode it. It's there. This, it's there. This, this is, this a, is a, a Jewish, a Jewish Roman, style Roman style production. Yeah, yeah. production. <laughs> yeah very unique. Yeah, very unique yeah. thought circle. Yeah. And, um, and that there should definitely have been a strong astrological, um, you know, component to this that they would have put in there and made subtle remarks to it. Yeah. That well, was Enki, just their style. Well, Enki, yeah. Enki is, Enki in, is, in, uh, is uh, Aquarius. Aquarius, for yeah. instance. For instance. And he's the and goat. He's bitch. the goat bitch. So they, so they, they can't they, interpret, they can't the, interpret symbols. the symbols. Okay, is there okay, a problem? problem? Valiant yeah. republished, republished uh, the symbols, uh, the symbols according, according to, to uh, uh, Clement, of, Clement Alexandria. of Alexandria. Fish. They don't understand, they don't anything, understand they anything they have. And I do. And I do. Okay. 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 So that's, <laughs> so that's I mean, this is, this is very, it's been very useful information to get okay. into about. 
Excellent. All right. Um, All right. Let me ask um, you about, let me ask you about the, the Rue. The Rue. Oh, yeah, the Rue. The, the name for Rue. Alexander. Name for Alexander. Because it is, because uh, it is uh, a mandrake, a mandrake, 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 mandrake pulse. Pulse. Yeah. That Menander that River. Menander River. Yeah. You are there in you are the book. The You're right at You're Lake Tritonus. You're right Tritonus. at Lake Tritonus. At- in, in Josephus, you have this just far-reaching typologic story um, using kind of literary construction devices that uh, have been used very few times, if ever. Um, and, and they tell the story of Eleazar, who was, uh, in my opinion, the actual uh, Jewish Messiah that the Romans captured on the Mount of Olives. But um, they have the story, which I know you're familiar with, in Josephus, of um, the magic rue, which is named uh, Baras, the sun, and would have been around for a long time if the Jews hadn't cut it down. Um, and, And this is related, that story is related to an event that occurs on the Mount of Olives. In in Josephus's version of the Mount of Olives capture, um, you have the individual comes from uh, you know a, an esteemed family, meaning the the Messianic lineage. Uh, you know, it's, it, you'd have to read that in, but this is what it means. But he is captured by Pedantius, a Roman soldier, in a way that's just impossible. He rides along and picks him up, and then and then carries him away. Um, and and Josephus very carefully uses the the technique of ripping out the mandrake root that Pendantius de Cordetis, uh, who was the famous uh, botanist and had written really the most famous book of, of, uh, of that era. Uh, was he, and, and he had described how you have to handle the, uh, the dangerous mandrake root. And so now, um, jo- now Josephus goes on and says that this individual Titus ordered to be not killed but pruned, like the, a botany <laughs> term that was used by Discord by Pedantius in, in his book on on how you uh, tamed like a wild plant and made it you know, to a domestic and useful one. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one thing that's always kind of amazed me, and you know, it's I, I guess because I just had a different way of understanding the Gospels that some things um, were almost self-evident to me, whereas they'd just been not even visible uh, to general scholarship. And the thing, one thing that I, I just have always been amazed at is that the overall vegetative um, metaphorical theme that is in um, the Gospels is not studied as a unique typologic construction. Because first of all, he's born in Nazareth, which is very likely, in fact, I think it's the the correct interpretation is branch, right? Meaning he is born in in a town called Branch. And of course, this is very, I I could explain why this is somewhat self-evident, but it would be kind of a digression. But the fact is it is, it is known that this is one of the possible interpretations of the word. But then, then this character who is, you know, claims to be um, of the uh, um, branch of David and the root of Jesse, right? So he is, he is linking himself into the Hebraic vegetative messianic symbolism, right? Um, who was born in, in Nazareth but then going forward now, he's captured on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, which means wine press, where yes. he is like literally yes. squirting blood out of himself. Right, um, right. And then they give him a crown of thorns, which then they hang him on a tree. Well, this is a vegetative construction that's from tip to stern. And so it is relating to the um, Hebraic messianic vegetative symbolism relating to the Messiah. It's obvious, but somehow modern scholarship doesn't look at this as a construction and they take these different aspects as though they're historical. The crown of thorns, the capture on the Mount of Olives, the 
the guard, the, the garden meaning wine press, the fact that he was born in Nazareth, and then he gets hung on the tree. But um, it's it is not uh, history. This is just a they are shaping their character uh, into the um, uh, the Hebraic messianic vegetative symbolism. So they are building upon that symbolism in the exact same way, Phil, that they build on the, um, the, the stories in the Old Testament, which they reuse as, as events from Jesus's life, because <clears throat> this is how they are linking him into the Hebraic literature. They are trying to shape the Hebraic literature uh, into a story <clears throat> which ends up uh, in a good place for the Roman Empire. That's right. the, Even though you the know the Greek myth. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm eating a bad right. bronchitis. Right. I had a really bad bout of bronchitis in my throat. It's still weak, so I have to constantly put these lozenges in there. I'm not being rude. I'm just trying to keep the voice working. Um, well, mythicism which Richard Carrier is part of, is, um, you know, it's un, un, you cannot disprove it. It's not falsifiable, um, but it doesn't really, it's not as a theory particularly strong because there's no archeologic evidence. You have to amend the text of different, you know, scripture, scriptural stuff if you want to even get the, the stuff that they use as the, um, the, the original, um, movement that kind of morphs into Christianity going forward. Most of these guys, and I, and I don't, I'm not really that familiar with Carrier's work, but um, like there, there have been different mythicists who, who posit that there was like a, a, a version of Christianity that, for example, that created Q, this, this theoretical construction of Q. And so there was this group of Jews that were you know, had, had literature, they, they thought that there was a Messiah who was, you know, what becomes the, the character of Jesus Christ. I mean, it just seems silly to me. I mean, the, the question is, how do we explain the literature that we have in front of us? And to me, there's one place to go, and that is the war. The war is where you get your understanding of this literature, the Roman Jewish war. Jesus is predicting events from the war. This cannot be disputed. Um, and then the other thing, which is another just head scratching moment for me, whenever I, I mean, now you, you have the, the old covenant, you know, with, with its Passover to start it off and then the 40 years of wandering and then the, uh, the occupation of the promised land of Israel, right? So you have this, this, construction that that forms the basis of the old covenant right the story of, of Moses and you know how, how the old covenant is established well the new testament has a passover lamb and you can they they put in enough detail so you can work out that it was 33 passover 33 that the the new uh covenant's passover lamb is gets slaughtered and then, of course, in Acts, you even have the Pentecost show up, you know, so they, you can right, see they're, right. they're very deliberately inside the system of, mm. of like, mirroring the Old, the old Testament's uh, uh, cycle. But now you go forward, and the war, uh, the Roman-Jewish war, ends on Passover 73. So it is a perfect 40-year cycle between the human Passover lamb that starts it off and the day that Rome gets, this is when Masada falls and Rome gets possession of all of Israel. Well, this is ludicrous and can only be created through back calculation, right? So you, you actually are, you're concretely, concretely showing that the ministry of Jesus is, is fiction with this little arithmetical insight. Um, but it, it also completely wires the character of Jesus Christ into the war. This is really where, where the this thought world is created. It's in the war. It's back calculating, going back 40 years from the war. So 
why historians don't see this. And, and I'll tell you, Phil, it just, as far as I know, and I, and I could be wrong because I, you know, I'm not um, that interested for one thing, um, but um, as far as I know, I'm the first person to have ever noticed this, which just is shocking to me. Okay. Um, I, I, don't think you, I don't think you are. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are thousands of people that have seen it, but I just, I'm not aware of it. And it were, and it's not something that's often discussed. And I don't understand how the mythicists are able to sort of under, how do you create the, the mythologic construction of the prior Christianities when the whole thing is obviously being calculated from the war, right? The war is really what is driving the literature, giving you the thought world that you can have, the, have the, these stories come out of. So this is, um, you know, the, you, you can, you know, you can just imagine anything. I mean, how would, how would someone disprove that there was a, a group of, um, of Jews who came to believe that there was a, a Messiah, you know, who was miraculous and had lived at the, I mean, you know, you, you can just, as long as you don't need to have any evidence of anything, what you can just go with, it, with whatever you want. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the, um, the idea that the, the Flavians created it um, is, you know, plugs into real history. Um, and uh, it's certainly the literature is, uh, is comprehensible. And, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, people often ask me, you know, they go, well, was he a historical character? Well, how could you disprove this, right? It's not possible. I mean, because it's like the character Donald Duck. I mean, the character Donald Duck was come the, comes from a, the fact that the cartoonist neighbor had a duck named Donald, right? So is Donald <laughs> Duck a historical duck? Well, it just depends on how you want to define the term. The term is, is amorphous. You can define it in many ways. There could certainly have been a messianic individual who then was embellished, you know, to some extent. But this isn't really the question. The question is, is what is the literature? Because we don't, we can never answer the question about, you know, people 2000 years ago. We have the literature. The literature is typological. When, when people look at the Gospels, they can see that so many of the stories of Jesus's life are actually just reconstructions of stories um, from the Old Testament. So all of this you can just assume is not historical, right? You can just assume it because you have a non-supernatural explanation for where the story comes from. But before Caesar's Messiah, there were a lot of these uh, stories in, G in Jesus's life, which they, they said, well, these are historical because we can't find any basis for them in the Old Testament. Well, the fact is there are basis for these stories in the Gospels. It's just they are occurring in Josephus. And when Caesar's Messiah came out, then the entire ministry of Jesus disappeared as history because you could give, um, you know, the reference for where every single story occurs. I mean... If you look at the, the crucifixion, um, well, this has been seen as a historical event. However, if you look in Josephus and you see the, the, the episode, which occurs at the correct point in the sequence of the three crucified, one survives, the guy who takes him down from the cross is not Joseph of Arimathea, but he's Joseph Barmatheus. Right, so you have, a play, you have this play on you have this play on words, you know. That's obvious, but it just that that story in Josephus filled just. I mean, it's like once you've seen it, you you don't have the idea that the story in the Gospels is history. It's not a strong idea because you go, well, this looks like the basis for the story. I mean, it certainly is related to it, and therefore. It's, this is a non-supernatural explanation as to where in the heck the story comes from. But my point is, is that it all disappears. Every single, you know, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the conclusion where he, uh, he's, he, he says Simon's going to have, uh, you know, uh, a death to glorify God and John is going to be spared. Um, 
Well, that's just a recreation of the, uh, the capturing of Simon and John, the rebel leaders, where then Simon goes off and uh, they crucify him. They take him to Rome, give, where he doesn't want to go and give him a death, glorify God. And John, they, they give life imprisonment to, they spare him. And so when, once you've kind of got the sequence, the sequence is really the key. Once you have the sequence, um, then you can just plug it all in and, and the whole historical thing of Jesus Christ disappears. And what's interesting is, is that a lot of the, of, the, of the parallels I show are either they're just historical, they're the same thing, like the encircling with the wall, or other scholars have talked about it. I mean, like there have been scholars that have written about the parallels of binding and loosing, loosening stories, the, the one in that Jesus talks about it, and the binding and loosening of uh, Josephus, right? Because they, the, there's so many of the words are reused in both stories. Um, um, so uh, in, in the, the little, what, the conclusion where they have Simon being taken to, you know, given a death to glorify God, Eisenman noticed that. He wrote about it in James, Brother of Jesus, and he goes, gee, he goes, this is strange. He goes, look, uh, the, the, both Simons are, are leaders of Messianic movements. They're both captured uh, and they're both taken to Rome and are you know, given a death to glorify God. He go, and Eisenman wrote, how many of these people were there? <laughs> and I mean, he had a good point. In fact, um, uh, he was at my house once and, uh, and we had him talk and I said, you know, if you had just, Notice that John had the same fate that that uh, you know they're talking about um, in the Gospels. I, I probably wouldn't have needed to have written Caesar's Messiah because you were so close to get to have got getting it. You know, um, you had that one parallel. If you just had looked around and you you might have noticed the other ones, and then it would have been, uh, you know, I mean, it would have been a different uh, literary career for me, but. Uh, Anyway, so it didn't happen. But the point is, is that, you know, you have all of these parallels, other scholars are writing about them. And then you have the historical events, which are the same thing. The really novel thing in Caesar Messiah is just that I said, well, look, these things are all occurring in the same order. Therefore, someone arranged them in the same order. That's the thing, is that there is a hand that is manipulating the construction of the literature so that the events will have the, the same sequence in the Gospels as they do in uh, Wars of the Jews. That's, that is uh, what the Romans left for us as a uh, piece of evidence as to, you know, the um, uh, creation, who wrote, the, who, who wrote them. And it also answers the real question, which is another thing that modern scholarship just kind of passes on, but I think is self-evident as, as it's the most serious question. And, that comes out of the gospels is Jesus talks about the son of man who's going to come. And when he comes, you're going to have all of the events, right? The Roman war is going to take place. The Jerusalem will be encircled. Temple's going to get raised, the abomination of desolation. And they're all going to, this is going to happen when uh, within, within the time before the generation passes away that Jesus is talking to. And of course, in a, you know, in, in a Hebraic literature, a generation is 40 years. All right. So it's going to happen within 40 years. Well, people wonder, well, who is Jesus talking about? Who is the son of man? Is he talking about himself because he doesn't seem to return? Well, no. I mean, it's, this is just the other half of the, uh, of the typologic, typologic literature because in Josephus, Josephus flat out says that the, the Jewish Messianic prophecies did not foresee a Jew. They foresaw the Flavian Caesar. So now there is your identity. Now, now the... The, the identity of the Son of Man Jesus predicts is now clear. It is the Flavian Caesar. It's just can, can, you, can, can, you, can you share, can that, you share prediction, that prediction uh, specifically, uh, specifically? Because it's because about, it's one, about one, seen one coming, in, seen the coming in the clouds. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean it's, uh, they, they have it in the synoptic three times. Uh, it's just the, it's called the, uh, you know, the apocalyptic vision of Jesus. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, he lists, um, you know, that this terrible disaster is going to fall. Um, and he, he foresees, like, among other things, that there will be, uh, you know, in the clouds, there will be soldiers in the clouds. And all, you know, just the typical apocalyptic stuff happens. Um, but he gives a date, 
you know, he gives a date that it's it's going to occur. He says it's going to be before the generation passes away. And he also in uh, in Mark he uh, he includes the um, destruction of the temple uh, and as one of the things that's going to occur. So you've got the events. I mean, this is only one event he could be referring to. He's talking about the Roman Jewish War, and and of course that's when this apocalypse that Jesus envisioned occurs. And in fact, the apocalypse that the word is not being used. This catastrophe that that is going to fall upon the Jews will happen. Um, so, I mean, the literature is, once you've got the typologic sequence kind of understood, then the literature becomes very, it's just straightforward. One thing I like about um, kind of the analysis in Caesar's Messiah is it makes the gospel, all the mysteries disappear. You can, you, you can read the literature without kind of puzzling over what is actually, you know, why is, why is, uh, why is it, you know, why, why did the author include this detail? You know, it doesn't make any sense, but when you plug it in as, as a typologic uh, relationship, then suddenly it all just becomes really straightforward. Right. That's a great right. guide. That's a great guide. I have an important, I have an important question, question, to, question you. to you. Mm -hmm. Are there Are any, there any uh, uh, presumed historical, historical characters in the Bible, in the Bible that you, that have, you to have, have to have? For to for, to, to support, to support your, your ideas. ideas. In other words, in if, other if, words, if, 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 if was fake, was fake, is that okay? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. So, you see, one thing about like the the literature that we have is you don't. First of all, it it basically voids what we know of the history of the first century, because really, without Josephus, I mean, what do we really have in the way of understanding the first century in Judea? There's nothing. There's little tiny snippets, you know, in Tacitus and stuff like that. There's nothing. So if you if you look at Josephus as a typologic construction, then the history is gone. And and even the dating is is obviously fake. You know, I mean, there is no way that um, that the temple was raised in 70. <laughs> because okay. 70 is okay. back calculation from, you know, to you know, to to a, a point in time, you know, from from the from the destruction of the temple, it's not. There's no seventy to 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 use. So may, it's, may, may I comment, may I comment that sure, two, temples two temples were destroyed by Titus's army? Okay, Titus's, okay, Titus's army, army also destroyed, also the, destroyed temple the temple of Jupiter. Of Jupiter. Uh, uh, Capitolina. Capitolina. Really? I didn't yes. know that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So what so I think, what they're, I think doing they're doing is opening, is opening a world, a world religion, religion. Saying you can, saying forget, you can the forget the Roman version. version. You can forget, you the, can forget Jewish the Jewish version. Jewish version. We, got the we got the international version. Okay. That's, yeah, what that's, I thought, that, that's, that's, that's very logical because I'm sure they had, um, you know, broad based plans for Christianity. The, the immediate political purpose, I think, was just to tone down the Messianic movement. But I, I really don't think, I'm, well, and incidentally, people say, well, you know, it didn't work very well, did it? You know, there was a con, there was the Bar Kokhba rebellion. The, well, they didn't really think they could convert zealots with this literature. They're really just trying to stop the missionary activity. Josephus mentions, you know, one of his, one of his ideas is that there's this missionary activity and the Romans are worried that this brand of Messianic Judaism will get out and you could have rebellions everywhere. And so I think that um, Christianity was just a way the, the, the Roman version was just a, it was a vert, what Christianity was in the, like from the beginning of the second century was just a, an aspect of the imperial cult wherein they would preach to Jews about uh, a pacifistic pro-Roman Messiah um, as a way to uh, not have the kind of Messiah that is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls become popular with the, um, with the, the, the Jews who were throughout the empire. They, there's different estimates as to how many and where they all were, but there was, it was a very large population, maybe 10, 15% of the people in the Roman Empire were Jewish. So they didn't want this to just spread everywhere, um, which in fact, uh, it ended up it, it happening. I mean, the Kiddos Rebellion was just a bloodbath. Um, 
the Jews took over, I believe it was Cyprus, and genocided all quarter million Gentiles. They wrote, they drove the Romans out of Egypt, for heaven's sakes. I mean, this was the Kiddos Rebellion. And then, of course, the Bar Kokhba is just, you know, well known as a as an absolute bloodbath. The Romans lost, you know, all sorts of uh, men in that in that struggle. So this um, the messianic aspect of uh, the Jewish, you know, kind of um, rebellion was something that they were, I think, trying to trying to head off with the Gospels. But I, I would say that really wasn't, I mean, the, I think you're right, that really what they were actually looking long term was they wanted a, a broad base religion. And, um, and they also wanted to create legacy. I mean, the, I think the real driving force of the typology is just the vanity of the, of the Caesars. Um, one little kind of interesting historical bonbon that a lot of people are not aware of is, you know, um, you have the Vatican. And uh, it has the, uh, that enormous uh, square that has an obelisk in the middle of it uh, in front of the, uh, yes. yeah. the Vatican Palace. Well, that is actually the literal Flavian Circus, which they would have their, um, you know, their chariot races and whatnot in. So you, you, you have a situation where the Pontiff Maximus, which was a title that the Flavians held, right? And they were they were the head of the Roman College of Priests, and they were known as the Pontiff Maximus. And they have their their you know their circle with the obelisks right in the middle of it. I mean, this is how ludicrous the um, the the kind of failure to link the Flavians into Christianity has been, because they they didn't even bother to move. They just are changed the titles. The Pontiff Maximus just set up shop. Um, for one day, he was the Roman Caesar, and the next day, he was the Pope. Amazing. Explain Explain your methods, methods as best as you best can, in, you your can in your own words. And why they and differ. Why they why differ. They differ. Why they differ. Well, oh, gosh. Um, the, the, um, the main, uh, I think, sort of the, the, to have the insights that to, led to Caesar from Sai was just uh, I didn't have any of uh, the incorrect academic training. Um, I, I was most focused on the religion um, as as a child, you know, and I think that kind of curiosity and and lack of uh, of prejudice. Um, when I have debates, and I often do with like uh, Christian scholars, they're just so certain about everything, you know. Um, and of course, the, the academics are the same way, particularly once they write a book. I mean, then it's they're they're ossified, you know. But I, I really wasn't like that when I started my I was just curious. And um, I think that's just a better platform because we didn't have we had not had a really satisfying explanation. I think the one of the reasons why the, the Caesar Messiah book is so popular is that is that even if it's incorrect, it's very satisfying. In other words, it is, you know, it is kind of a tip to stern. Uh, explanation of all the literature. You don't have big gaps of like, well, we don't know what this means. And that could have been, you know, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, like someone could have uh, like put that into the, the literature years later. It was, uh, you know, an addition that someone, they have all these different, I mean, I just take the literature as is. I don't, I don't change a single word if I say, look, it, it's pretty much like they wrote it. Um, Vaticanus where, you know, which is a you know, the oldest version we have looks uh, like it's probably, to me, it looks like it would have been the stuff that Constantine would have come up with. Um, and um, and so we, we just have this literature and we can make sense of the literature. And, and that's, I think, kind of all we can do uh, in terms of history. They, the idea of looking backwards and using this literature as a way to find the history, <laughs> I, I think this is far-fetched. I mean, this is literally um, as far-fetched as believing in the miracles, you know, believing right. that you can... Well, the mythicists the say, them say themselves. themselves. They're, they're, they're saying they're that saying it, it, there is mythological, there is mythological contamination, contamination throughout this. Throughout this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and well, then yeah, they I never try to, never interpret try to interpret it. it. Yeah, I mean, the mythicists, I, I just don't know how far they can really go with this idea because even though it's not 
falsifiable. There just isn't any sort of evidence that can really, I mean, you can, you can construct really nice sort of logical kind of, you know, ideas about it, about how there could have been another group we don't know about. I mean, but when, once you're at, well, there's a group there's no evidence of, and it was producing this literature in just the right way that it ends up in the gospels. I mean, this is far-fetched, right? Just off the bat, because you don't have like, well, where's the evidence of this group? If the group doesn't make any sense historically because this is a time when there was rebellion against Rome. Why would there have been, you know, the pacifist pro-Roman group, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, there, Phil, there was a, a pro-Roman group, but it was the Herodian Sanhedrin. I mean, it was the, the Roman, I mean, the, the Herods have been trying to breed a Christ for generations. They would always take Hasmonean brides and then, you know, have a child and raise them in Rome and, and then send them back there as the king. But the public wasn't buying it, you know. So I, I, this kind of shows me that this idea of like a pro-Roman, you know, group that's wandering around and has uh, liter you know, ideas about this Jesus character. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, again, I can't disprove it. I just, I don't, where's the evidence for this group? Um, so it's, uh, I mean, uh, mythicists will, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just wish them well. I mean, I, I don't think they're going to get very far with their, I, they won't get much further than they have. And um, they'll have, they won't really have much impact on Christianity itself. Okay. Um, okay. Because what, what can you do with the, you know, ideas about a, a group that, there's no evidence of, no real physical evidence. I mean, the Christians will always just, they'll look at things um, like that as, uh, you know, kind of irrelevant. I see. Um, I see. Um, before, before I forget, before I forget yeah. Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Who, what, do you, what is your take on Magdalena? Magdalena. Well, I mean, um, Miguel, I, I think it's... Uh, you know, she would, would have been one of the females um, uh, at, you know, around the Sea of Galilee um, that, uh, you know, this is actually linking into um, the, 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 the symbolic theme of the fish. The fish is a very important symbolic. Um, Agreed. Theme. Agreed you know, in, in the Gospels. And, and so she is just the introduction of that. Um, but, you know, remember, she's a stick figure. You know, they have these fantasies about her marrying Jesus and all this stuff. But I mean, right. there's what, like right. three, three or four lines or something? I mean, where are you getting yeah. all this from? It's imagine, yeah. imagination. I, I like her I, I when she was when Jam Nuna. She is actually an Ishtar. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, I, I think if you want to go deeper, I like your approach, honestly. I would like to see the, more of the analysis of the characters coming from the perspective of a Roman astrological and a Roman pagan thought world. Because yes. that's something, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, it's a weakness in Caesar's Messiah. I didn't really, I didn't have the background to be able to do that kind of analysis. And I was more, I mean, in, in fact, I... There's a lot of typologic linkage in there that I saw that I didn't record uh, in the book because it was too abstract. And I thought, nah, I just didn't leave the, this is going to be tough enough to defend as it is. So it's just what you have in Caesar's Messiah is just a stripped down version of, of the whole typologic system. And it's just there to, con to show people it exists. That's really all, my only hope with the book is to show that the system does exist. Um, right. And, um, I and, accept um, that, I, it that it does. No, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I wholeheartedly endorse, endorse uh, Mr. Uh, Atwell's Mr. methods. Well, that's I'm glad, and and I think it's been a, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a useful book for people to get a, uh, I think, a clear understanding of Christianity. But I will say that it is just a first step, um, and I am often that people are saying, well, you know, you didn't explain this or that. And yeah, there is probably 95% of the, of the depth that these uh, wordsmiths were able to create in terms of literature um, that is not really, you know, brought out in Caesar and Messiah. And I think it, it might be a um, kind of a productive era going forward if the book becomes really kind of widely understood in the academic world, because I really, I would love to go through, I mean, with the understanding 
with the interpretive framework of this is this this literature is coming from the Roman thought world. Therefore, we're going to have the mystery religions. We're going to have uh, astrology. We're going to have other, you know, like historical characters like Julius Caesar, you know, could be popping. I mean, let's look at let's look at the literature like that. Um, I wanted to just mention like a. So people say, well, where, you know, is there any, like, where is the archaeologic evidence, you know, of this relationship, you know, into the imperial court, you know, like, why didn't they, why didn't they tell us about, it? well, of course, you know, they were trying to establish a religion, it wouldn't be very good to give away the, the punchline, you know, um, before people had become, uh, you know, had, had become uh, converts, and then the dark ages had been set up with, uh, the, you know, the feudal system, right. but I've, I've always thought like one one thing that really makes the kind of the relationship clear is just Constantine's um, uh, his his uh, you know his his grave. Um, his he he uh, set up his tomb in a in a church, and then brought in the um, icons, physical uh, relics of all of the twelve apostles, and then put these relics in a circle around his tomb. So in other words, he's giving you a clue as to who Jesus is, isn't he? You know, so right. this right. this I thought was well, you know, it, it again the um, the the ideas in Caesar Messiah plug really well into history, and um, so it's uh, you know it's been an interesting experience having having brought the book out and having it become uh, you know well known. Um, but I hope I uh, uh, you know will be able to see uh, your work, Philip, when you bring it out, because I, I'm oh, actually, well, I'm a you. little, I'm a little more interested to tell you that the current, let's, at, let's at, take Paul. at this let's point, I'm more Paul. interested, I'm more interested in the new, uh, <laughs> new insights and the, because okay. I've, I've been okay. dealing with mine for so many years. So let's take, Paul. let's take Paul. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Saul, Saul Paulus, Paulus relates uh, to, honey. he relates to, he relates to Apollo, Apollo Tarsios. Tarsios. And his prophet, Tiresias, via Tarsus. Yeah, I see, because that's how the, the, tar, the whole Tarsus thing gets in there. Yes, Paul, and even yeah. Tarsus <laughs> is, is its own it's story. Its own story. Okay, because you know, it's, it's, based on, it's based on, it's based on Tarhunsa. Tarhunsa. You know, Tarhunsa is, is Zeus. Zeus. That's fascinating. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you send me this? Do you have, have you written this up? And would you be permitting? Would you permit I, me to I've read it? Not, I'd I'm like not releasing writing. Releasing writing. I, okay, except, I, I don't blame you. My, um, except in my, but I am anyway, going to send you. I'm going to send you everything I got. Everything I got. If you okay. if you send it to me, I will. I believe me. I will. I will treat it in strictest confidence. And but I'm just. You can imagine I'm very curious about this. Oh, I would yeah. love to get oh, my yeah. hands on this stuff. So oh, wait till oh, you wait till see you Anatolian, see Anatolian Apollo. Apollo. He's Poseidon. Cool. Poseidon. Well, let's uh, so maybe we can have another discussion about it. I think it'd be kind of an interesting talk, don't you? Yeah. Excellent, sir. Excellent, sir. I, I, will I, I will include, include a request, include a request to re-interview re you at your leisure. Uh, always ready, to, happy to talk to you, Phil. So. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on, and All right. uh, I'm looking forward, looking forward to your material. Great book, Atheist Community. Read it.